very strong start this semester. Our, our speaker today is Tyler Whitaker. I'll give you a very brief introduction and then Tyler will, will tell his story. Uh, he is the CTO, COO, and co-founder of L2L.com that uh, is formerly leading to lean. Uh, we will find out a little bit more what that means here in a moment. Uh, what they do is they are a software provider to the, manuf the manufacturing industry and they are uh, based in Boston and Salt Lake City. Uh, the software that they provide, the uh, manufacturing industry has won many awards and accolades that includes from Newsweek, Forbes, Gartner, LNS, and Frost and Sullivan's Manufacturing Leadership Council. Uh, very impressive list of awards and accolades. Uh, Tyler is the organizer of the CTO Breakfast, a, that is a technology-focused networking group that serves the Salt Lake City area. Uh, he has served on many boards and, and uh, has many philanthropic uh, endeavors, uh, including he has served on the, board, the National Board for Families Supporting Adoption and United for Adoption. Uh, Tyler and his wife, Mandy, who is here on the front row, uh, they are proud parents of two children, uh, Jordan and Brooklyn, also on the front row, and we are glad they're here. Uh, Tyler has many, many connections to SUU. Uh, both of his parents attended SUU, a grandparent attended SUU, his sister attended SUU, his wife Mandy attended SUU, uh, and are all alumni. Uh, his son Jordan is now a fourth generation SUU student studying history here. Please give a very warm welcome to Tyler Whitaker. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It's, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. I brought some notes so I don't forget anything. Um, as, uh, as Tyler mentioned, uh, I have a lot of strong connections here at SUU. Grew up coming down here a lot. Uh, I'm the black sheep of the family. I went to BYU, so I apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the rest of my family has, has really uh, deep connections here. Um, you guys are so lucky to have a class like this. Uh, and Tyler's done a great job organizing this. Um, uh, and you're so lucky to have uh, a university with a president like, like Mindy Benson. Um, I don't want to get emotional. She's very special to our family. Uh, deep connections there. She's done a lot for our family. Uh, she means a lot to us. And you guys are so lucky to have her um, as a president. So today what I'd like to do is take you a little bit through my history, uh, tell you a little bit about my story, uh, and share some of the things that my entrepreneurship uh, journey has taught me, things that I wish I knew when I was your age. So hopefully, hopefully that comes through. Um, first off, I'd like to get to know you a little bit better. How many business majors do we have here in the room? Okay, awesome. Uh, and what year in school are you? How many freshmen do we have? Okay, couple. Sophomores? Okay, juniors? Perfect, and seniors, uh, any graduate students? Okay, awesome, pretty good, pretty good mix. Okay, so uh, not all of your business majors, um, that's, that's awesome. My entrepreneurship uh, journey started um, through computer science. I'm a technologist at heart, I love technology, I love learning how uh, things come together, I love building systems, uh, large scale distributed systems, and uh, that skill set took me through to, to where I actually started a, a business. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about the end of the story first and then I'll go back to the beginning. Uh, I'm the CTO, COO for Leading to Lean. We do uh, lean manufacturing software. Uh, we founded the company just over 13 years ago, 13 and a half years ago. Uh, two, two partners and I founded the business. We carved it out of a company in Northern Utah called AutoLeave, auto, large automotive manufacturer automotive safety product manufacturer, and it's based on Toyota Lean manufacturing principles, which some of you might recognize when you th uh, you've heard the, the term uh, Lean Startup. And so uh, really interesting set of, of principles. It's all about removing waste. I'll talk a little bit more about that later and continuous improvement. But the, the key, key driver, I think, through my career has been continuous improvement and small turning points. 
small decisions I've made along the way that made all the difference in, in my life. So um, when I was 15 years old, uh, my, uh, one of my early mentors was Alan Ashton. Alan Ashton, I get emotional thinking about him. Alan Ashton uh, was one of the founders of WordPerfect Corporation. So before Silicon Slopes, there was Novell, uh, there was WordPerfect, there was Evans and Sutherland, there's just a couple, a handful of uh, technology companies that really started the tech scene in Utah. And Alan Ashton was one of the, one of the founders there. He was a, a, a next door neighbor of mine, uh, an inspiration to me. He, uh, I happened to be over to his house one day showing him some code that I had written with some friends um, and asking him for, for advice and, and what, what should we do with it. And at the end of that, that session, he said, you know, if you keep, if you keep on this track, uh, there'll be a job for you at WordPerfect. And, and uh, I don't know why I asked, but I said, um, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. What is the opportunities to, to work at WordPerfect? I'm 15 years old. And he said, I mean, to his credit, he said, give me a resume and I'll see what I can do. And so I promptly went home, talked to my parents and said, what's a resume? <laughs> and, and this is before Google. I couldn't Google it. We, we wrote something up and it, it had zero experience on it. Um, but I, I took it over to him and uh, he gave me the right intros to work it, at WordPerfect that summer. Um, in the VAX VMS testing group. VAX VMS was a mini mainframe uh, 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 computing platform at the time and uh, all of my colleagues were 20 and 30 and 40 somethings. And here I am a month after my 15, 15th birthday um, just trying to act the part, right? So I, I dressed up, you know, and, and walk in the first day and start going through some training and start meeting people and start going to lunch with, with people. And by the end of the first week, um, I'd, I'd made some friends and, and, and uh, we were coming back in and we happened to stop uh, at the receptionist desk and we're all talking as a group. And the receptionist turns to me and says, Tyler, we have an office pool on how old or what year in school you are. And I said, well, and, and everybody's like, their heads pivot over to me and I said, uh, well, I'm a sophomore. I'll be a sophomore in, in school. And, and she says, oh, a sophomore in college. And I said, no, a sophomore in high school. <laughs> and they lost it. They all lost it. And for about a month after that, uh, I'd receive random pages through the whole building saying, Tyler, your mom's on line one. You forgot to make your bed. <laughs> you know. Um, so I don't know if I became the mascot there or, or what, but, but that lesson taught me that number one, Ask for what you want. No matter how, how scary it is, you gotta learn to ask for what you want. Knowing what you want is another thing, and maybe I'll talk about that in a minute. But you need to learn to ask for what you want. And number two, when you get in a situation, act as if you belong there. Look the part. Learn how to talk the part. Act as if you belong there. Because you do. I belong there every bit as much as the rest of those, those folks. Great, great people. Um, one of the things that I, that I did was uh, I tried to go to lunch with those folks as much as I could, every day. I was making pennies, really. <laughs> I, think I, I think my starting wage was four eighty an hour. And, um, and within, the first, uh, within the first week, my boss came back to me and said, hey, um, we're going to give you a $200 raise. How does that sound? And I said, wow, that's great. Like, yeah, I'll take that. Little did I know, they hadn't run the math and I was working below minimum wage and they realized they needed to bump me up just to make minimum wage. But, and, but that, was, that was great money for me and, and every bit of that money was poured right back into going to lunch with these guys so that I could learn from them. And, and that was the starting of my networking. So by raise of hands, um, how many of you know at least one other person in the room? Okay. Um, how many of you know two people? How about five? Keep them up. Five. Uh, ten. How many of you know ten? Kind of? Kind of? Um, what's your name? Brenda. Brenda? Brenna. Brenna. And what's your name? I'm Hugo. Hugo? Yes, sir. Okay. Brenda Hugo. 
You guys need to meet them. They're the, they're the networkers in the room. They're the connectors, right? Hopefully you can find them on LinkedIn. Are you guys on LinkedIn? You all should be on LinkedIn. What I want you to do is connect with me. I've got thousands of connections out there. I want you to connect with me and let me know that you're in this class. And I'll be more than willing to help connect you to people. Networking, lesson three, networking is very important. It's not what you know so much as who you know. Honestly, it's a combination of both. But the more you network, the better off you're gonna be. Now by raise of hands, how many of you have sales and marketing skills? Or sales skills, let's start with sales skills. Okay, awesome. How many of you have marketing skills? Okay, are you looking around? How many of you have accounting skills? Okay, how many of you are in, interested in legal? Okay, perfect. What about technology skills? Are there any technologists here? Okay, cool, awesome. People that know how to code, people that know how to build web pages. Um, you have the makings right here in this class of building your own startup. Get to know each other. Because one of the things that I've learned in my life is that the, the people that I associate with, I end up doing business with later. Or they introduce me to people that I end up doing business with later. So I'm working at WordPerfect. Um, this is, wow, 30, 35 years ago. <laughs> this is dating me. Um, and I, I worked there for four years. I meet a ton of people. Um, I, I then leave to go on an LDS uh, mission. I served in uh, Seattle, Washington, and that taught me how to talk to anybody, right? You gotta learn to, to talk to people. You gotta learn to open your mouth. You gotta learn to find out what's interesting to, about them. You need to find out uh, you know, what you have in common, and that's part of networking, right? So when I came back, um, the word perfect had been sold to Novell. $400 million, four or $500 million acquisition. Um, the group that I was in had been outsourced to a little company called Spire Technologies. So it takes me about uh, 30 days to track these people down, these people I knew. And they say, oh, we're working with this company. You know, they, they're a reseller in this space. Um, I find, a, I find out who they work with, uh, great man, Jeff Webster. And I call him up and I say, Jeff, I used to work in that team. I'd like to come talk to you. And he's like, sure. Yeah, come on in. Come in. Here I am, fresh off with the mission. Young, young kid. Start talking tech with him. We, we have a great conversation for about 30 minutes talking about technology. And he looks at me and he says, why are we talking? <laughs> what are we talking? You know, why are you here? And I said, well, I want a job. And he says, okay. You're hired. Again, ask for what you want. What's he gonna say? Is he gonna say no? Could have, he, he very well could have. And, and uh, like super blessed to, to get to know him and, and to, to have worked with him and for him to, to, to give me a job there. Um, again, I started going to lunch with the guys that I worked with there. Evan Davis, Jake Wilson Hume. A uh, bunch of bunch of folks, and through the through the course of getting to know them and learning more, developing my skills so that I, I have value that I'm adding value to that organization. Um, I've become their first webmaster. Uh, you know, as the web was was coming on. You guys are digital natives. Um, you know, I I was right there at the start of of you know web one one dot oh, um, building out the web. Um, you guys are you know webs native to you and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about ai but the the, fun, the fundamental shift that happened in industry when the web came on i see that same pattern coming through again with ai so if you're not playing with ai you ought to be playing with ai don't use it to cheat you probably your professors probably you know have some some rules about that but if you're not using ai as a tool you're going to be left behind doing some really strategic research right now for my company and AI, I can't, I can't talk to any analysts without them saying AI is a game changer, fundamental game changer. So um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, um, so there I am, um, 
you know, web's just starting, we're building technology. Um, we realize as a company that the reseller business that we're in is great, but we really have a core competency in customer support. We're really great at customer support. WordPerfect was known for its customer support. Uh, Spire Technologies then became Cento, uh, you know, became known for its, its technical support and we developed some core competencies there. And as a business, um, we realized we should pivot. Pivots, pivots are something you'll learn about. If you're not familiar with pivots, they're necessary to business. As you learn what markets uh, want, and as you recognize deficiencies in your own product, you may pivot. That's not a bad thing. You'll want to pivot. You'll want to find out what, what those uh, customers are wanting, that customers you have access to, and you're going to want to deliver it to them. And that's how you make money. And so we pivoted to uh, build out call center infrastructure, and we built one of the first SaaS call center infrastructure companies uh, you know, on the planet, uh, known as EchoPass. Uh, we funded that company, we carved it out of, of Cento uh, with some, some venture capital funding. Uh, we raised $28 million to build two redundant um, uh, data centers. Um, you know, real advanced technology, spent a lot of money building this out and, and grew that business. That business eventually sold for $100 million to, to Genesis uh, Telecommunications in 2013. But through, that, through the, the course of my time there, we built out some really incredible things. We were the first uh, computer telephony interface uh, provider to interface with Salesforce.com. Massive company now. We were one of the founding development partners there. Um, and and we, um, we maybe were pro pretty naive. We didn't know what wasn't possible. And because of that, we built it, right? So don't ever, don't ever let somebody tell you it's not possible. You know, you, you, you'd be amazed at what you can do if you're given the chance and you're, you're given the opportunity. So, so anything's possible. Um, all of those business, businesses up to that point had been driven by somebody in a room thinking, what if? And that's one of the key, I, key, um, key items that I rec recognized in my entrepreneur journey, entrepreneurship journey is that um, great businesses are driven by, by great ideas. And anybody can have that idea, right? That value it starts as somebody's idea. So, built out, this, built out this company. I eventually left left uh, Echo Pass um, through um, some some networking opportunities. I had uh, gone to a networking event and met uh, Dennis Wood from VSpring Capital, one of the the VSpring uh, the venture capitalists in Salt Lake. Great guy. Um, happened to say hi to him. Happened to get to know him. Uh, a week later, I'm, I'm walking out of a Quiznos. He's walking in. He doesn't really remember me. And I, and I have this impression, I should say hi to him. I said, oh, hey, how's it going? Dennis, how are you? It's good to see you again. And at first, he, he, he takes him a minute and remembers me. And, and uh, we have a, a nice little exchange. And a week later, he calls me up and he says, you know what? I have, I have a, a business you need to come look at. And that was uh, Symbiote Business Group. Uh, Symbiote Business Group was a really interesting company. Um, it built out um, uh, technology solutions and network networking opportunities for property service, the property services industry. So snow and ice management, landscaping, pest control. Um, and I spent two years there helping them build up their networks, nationwide networks. And what that really taught me is that there's a huge opportunity in non tech businesses. Now I'm a tech business founder. I, I love technology businesses. But one of the things that, um, that I think is really interesting and exciting are, are, are businesses that are almost recession proof, right? We talked about AI a minute ago. I was on a, a call yesterday with, with a, a, a leading lean manufacturing expert and, and he made a, the comment, um, AI is not going to be your plumber. And, and as we talked through that idea, there's always gonna be a need for plumbers, for electricians, for uh, work in the trades. And as an entrepreneur, 
Like, I love tech companies. If you want to start a tech company, like, let me know. I'm, I'm more than willing to talk you through that. But there's huge opportunity in entrepreneurship in companies that maybe aren't so flashy, you know, that aren't the next TikTok, but that are solid businesses that drive incredible value, you know, into the communities and can drive incredible personal wealth. So I got to, to, to network with, with hundreds of, of small business owners that, that all had made significant wealth through delivering services that are necessary for people every day and that aren't the, the, the next Facebook. So if you think about entrepreneurship, open your minds to the idea that, that entrepreneurship's all around you. One of the things that I learn at, at uh, love about leading to lean is I get to go see things manufactured, right? And everything around us was was built in a factory. Everything, the chairs you're sitting on, the the screens behind me, the projectors, um, everything was built by somebody in a factory somewhere. I've been all over the world, uh, meeting with manufacturers from Europe to Asia to China to uh, Australia, um, we have customers in South America, South Africa. Um, it, it, you'd be amazed at how much manufacturing goes on. And that's the exciting thing about, for me about this business is I get to go see it made. I've seen um, you know, 50 caliber ammunition and rocket uh, ammunition uh, by, made by the US government. I've seen airbags, uh, inflators, and seat belts made in China. I've, I've seen... Um, you know, food processing plants. I've seen, um, you know, it just all kinds of really interesting consumer products, architectural products, building materials, um, you know, and, and these people make really great money and they build really great companies and drive a tremendous amount of value. So the, the idea there is that um, if you can see an opportunity, don't be afraid of what industry it's in go after it. That's the, all businesses are found on a great idea, a great service or product that's delivered to a real customer need. And so staying close to those customers is, is really important. Um, one of the things that I learned uh, um, after, after leaving the Symbiot Business Group and, and through some networking, I met Josh Coates. Um, does anybody know Josh Coates? Has anybody heard that name before? Uh, you may not know his name, but you use his product. So he is, has been the CEO at Instructure that makes Canvas. You guys all know Canvas? So I, I know, and it was <coughs> privileged to know a couple of the early founders there and, and Josh Coates, of course. Um, I worked with him at a company called Mosey.com, uh, Berkeley Data Systems. We did uh, consumer grade uh, online backup. So we pushed petabytes of, of data into big storage arrays and, uh, you know, and, and helped enable uh, people to, to back up their memories. And what he called that business was a good karma business. And that's something that's also important for you, is that not all business opportunities are driven uh, or have uh, great purposes behind them, right? Great uh, value that they're driving. You know, uh, TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook, um, there's some positives there, there's some negatives there, right? What you want to be, ultimately, you'll want to be part of a business that, that drives real value, that helps people, that makes a difference in the world. And as you get older, um, and as you get further in your career, um, and as you achieve some level of success and wealth, one of the things that will become important to you is the impact and, and uh, influence you're making in the world in general and the difference you're making and the legacy you're making. And so if you start planning for that now and building your career around what types of, what types of positive changes do I want to make in the world, not only will you be more fulfilled, but you'll have, um, you'll have a, an incredible you know, life to look back on and say, you know what, I made a difference. And that was something that Josh Coates told me is, you know, taught me is that a business can, can have karma. A business can be, be something that, that's a positive, um, a positive system uh, you know, in the world. Um, about that time, um, you know, I told you I had worked with uh, vSpring Capital with Ed Ekstrom and, and 
Gavin Christensen, great, great guys. Gavin's now uh, the general partner at Kickstarter Fund. Uh, he's doing some great work over there. Um, I was privileged to be part of what's called the vSpring V100, which uh, used to be a, a recognition of the top 100 entrepreneurs uh, or potential upcoming entrepreneurs. Uh, I had an opportunity to be part of that for three years in a row, which was, which was really a great, great honor and, and blessing in my life. And one of the, at one of the events that we had, we were at the, uh, the soccer stadium, the Real Salt Lake Soccer Stadium in Salt Lake, and uh, Larry H. Miller, um, met with us and, and, and was kind of the keynote speaker. Um, you might recognize him, his name's associated with this building here and, and the, the Entrepreneurship Center. Um, this was about a year before he died um, and he, um, he spent about 45 minutes with us talking through his life and telling his story. And one of the things that really stuck out to me was his, um, his comment that we're one generation away from losing capitalism. And at the time, I didn't understand that. I thought, well, what are you talking about? Like, this is an institution. This is what America's built on. Like, wh what, wh why, why do you say that? Um, and as he went on to talk, he said, look, the, the tides are shifting. And if we're not training the next generation in the value of capitalism, um, we're, we're, we're going to lose it. This was 20 years ago. And, and I thought, oh man, you know, uh, really, seriously, oh, that's interesting. I kind of filed that away. And what do we see now? We see a lot of pressure on capitalism that it's not the best system. I'm here to tell you, it is, it really is, right? Capitalism is a free exchange of, of goods for, for currency or money, goods for value. Um, there's no compulsion there. It drives the right behaviors. That that um, motivated self-interest actually lifts the economy. Every place where people have tried to replace capitalism with some other form of economic or ec economic model, they fail. They do. They 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 absolutely fail. And so, like, I'm really excited to see this room so full of people who are interested in entrepreneurship. Because not only is it a, a huge opportunity for you to build personal wealth and, and make a difference in the world, but it's, it's what our economy is built on. It's what our country is built on. It's a, it's a founding principle that has, um, has a, a lasting uh, effect on, on our way of life. And so every chance you get, please stand up for capitalism. Please teach your roommates, your friends, your neighbors, you, you know, when you get married and have kids, teach them uh, about capitalism. Because without capitalism, um, it, it's, a whole different, it's a whole different view. And you, I think you can look out there at uh, countries that don't embrace capitalism and, and you'll see, see, the, see the effects of that. So um, it wasn't long after uh, Mosey. So Mosey um, sold to EMC for $78 million in 2007 um, and I was able to fortunate enough to be able to step away from the business at that time I spent about three years off um, semi-retired I call it semi-retired um, my my co-workers became uh, Pam and Jim from uh, the office <laughs> I would put that on the TV I would work on my laptop and I would come up uh, from from my office and tell my wife oh you should have heard what Pam said today or Jim said today at the office um, but uh, the, the thing I learned there, what I was really doing was just resetting. I'd been going for a long time, right, at that point. And, and um, capitalism is the right system. Starting a business is a huge opportunity. Um, it can be a grind, too. You gotta, you gotta learn to pace yourself a little bit. It's really easy to wanna just grind all the time. And uh, I took three years off to be able to recharge a little bit, to look for the, my next venture, look for the next opportunity, um, to, to dabble in some, some, some startups. Um, and eventually, um, through, through my friends at vSpring Capital, found uh, this opportunity with Leading to Lean. Um, I was introduced to a man named uh, Bob Argyle, uh, who eventually became my partner, great friend, um, 
great friend, um, and he was at AutoLeave in northern Utah um, and had learned lean manufacturing principles from a, 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 a Toyota uh, lean manufacturing sensei. Um, and, and it opened my, my world up to this idea of continuous improvement. Um, through a through, uh, course of events, we were able to carve that, that the product that he had built within AutoLeave, we were able to carve that out and form a business around it. Uh, I brought uh, Keith Barr from my days at, at Cento and Echo Pass uh, with me, asked him to come uh, join and be our CEO. And the three of us founded this company and bootstrapped it. Does anybody know what bootstrapping is? Has anybody heard of bootstrapping? A little bit, yeah? Financing it yourself, that's exactly right. I'd gone the VC route. Keith and I had, had raised 28 million. Uh, you know, at, uh, at Mosey, we were venture backed. At Symbiote, we were venture backed. Um, and I think at this point, we realized we could screw it up just as good as the VC could. <laughs> that's what we told ourselves. And so we took our own money, we put $100 in each, and we started the business. Now, th the way we, you do bootstrapping is you gotta be close to the customer. You got to let the customer's revenue, you know, fees they're paying in fund the business. And so we, we went without paychecks for, for a long time uh, as, we, as we bootstrapped this company. But we believed in the idea. We knew it was possible. We knew that the customers loved the, the technology. We knew we could improve the technology and get more and more customers there. And so bootstrapping is not for everybody, but it's a viable alternative. And if you think about the, the items you need to do f uh, as you're bootstrapping, uh, staying close to the customer, letting the revenue dictate wh what you do, and living within your means, um, it's, it's great advice for any kind of startup, right? Whether you're venture backed, or whether you're bootstrapping yourself. Um, if you're staying close to the customer, you're responsive to their needs, and they're voting every, every month, in my case with a, a SaaS revenue model, um, then you know you're doing the right things. Right? I think in my venture past, sometimes we built products and services that didn't resonate in the market. We built it expecting them to come. It was a field of dreams, right? If you build it, they will come. We built it, they didn't come. Right, and so staying close to your customers and, and driving values specifically for them that they're willing to pay for is, is the name of the game there. So um, Leading to Lean has been a, a wild ride. Um, we've, we've grown it where we have uh, hundreds of thousands of users that are on the platform now. We're, on, uh, we're all over the world. We've got hundreds, hundreds of sites uh, across, across the world I've spent um, I've spent you know, nine, nine weeks in China over the last several years uh, working with customers there. I've spent time in Europe working with customers. Uh, spent time in, in Australia, uh, which it was, was awesome. Um, and so uh, you know, it's, been a fun, it's been a fun ride, but it hasn't been easy. I've got gray hair here to show for that, right? One of the things that you'll learn um, from a startup business perspective is is as, as the owner, it's on you. You've gotta be the one to, to get up every day. You've gotta be the one to make the hard decisions. You've gotta be the one to, to drive the right behaviors and, and respond to the market needs. And, and that, that's, uh, it's not easy, but I can tell you it's worth it. I can definitely tell you it's worth it, right? Here about three years ago, we were able to, to um, kind of switch out from being uh, bootstrapped. We brought in a partner, M33. Growth out of uh, Boston, great partners. Uh, Mike Anello uh, there and his team are, uh, are amazing people to work with. And that's given us uh, some, some additional fuel and, and expertise to grow the business. We've been able to triple uh, our revenue in the last several years. And so, um, and, and we're on a, on a great trajectory now. Um, but I, I'm here to tell you that uh, it's possible, it's worth it. And if you pay attention to your customers, you know, they'll, they'll get you there. Um, questions. I'm going to open it up for questions at this point. I've, I've done a lot of talking here. How many, how many of you are, are starting businesses now? Okay. What, what's your business? Well, my business is a pocket knife company for 
Melchizedek Priest holders with oil vial in the back. Yeah, yeah, nice. Awesome. Where are you sourcing your product from? Um, a factory in China. Yeah. I'm sold online through a little website I made. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Right now, is it's it's easier to start a business now than it ever has been, right? Web gives you distribution, the connectivity in the world right now to be able to source materials. It's 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 you know it's, it's incredible. Um, I think AI is going to drive that even further, right? Um, how many of you use ChatGPT? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's some amazing generative AI things that are happening there. Um, there's some amazing uh, uh, use cases out there where people are starting businesses using AI, right? They're, they're letting AI write their marketing copy. They're, they're letting AI help direct uh, uh, you know, a bunch of the, the, uh, the content generation for their business, right? Um, so one of the things I would tell you is, is catch, catch the waves as they come. Um, I, you know, I was able and, and fortunate enough to catch the, the web, the wave of the web, the rise of the, of the, the, the World Wide Web, and, and to watch that and to go. And then I was also able to uh, capture the rise of, of uh, infrastructure as a service uh, providers like Amazon Web Services. So we raised 28 million at Echo Pass. Um, you know, 20 of that probably went to building our two redundant data centers, right? Um, flash forward a couple of years, I'm at Mosey. Um, we were able to, for a tenth of the cost, we were able to do, use co-location facilities where we're able to take our servers and put them in somebody else's data center and, and build out a, a tremendous amount of infrastructure there, right? Flash forward a couple more years when we founded EchoPass, it was fully Amazon, fully in the cloud, we're also a fully distributed company. So we've been work from home, fully distributed for the last 13 and a half years. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet Matt Mullenweg, uh, who is the CEO, CEO of Automatic. They make the software WordPress, if you've ever used the software WordPress to build websites. Um, and they had a distributed company model. And that was about the time I was forming EchoPass. And I, I realized that if I, if I wanted to have the right talent, and the right uh, people um, in, in our company, I'd need to go look all over the world for them, potentially. And so having a distributed company became very important to us. Um, gave us redundancy, gave us uh, this uh, ability to, to work from wherever we are. Um, my wife will, will tell you that I've worked from some interesting places. I've worked from cruise ships, I've worked from uh, the beach. Uh, I've worked from uh, Europe. I've worked, you know, in in a small hotel room out in the outback of Australia. Um, so there's some really interesting capabilities now uh, because of the technology where you can definitely start a business anywhere you want, right? You can start a business right now in your apartment, um, and it could be it could become a worldwide business in the next couple of years. You know, the only thing is that's holding you back. Is, is probably you, frankly, right? What are the limitations of what, what do you know, what, what do you not know? Who do you know? Who can you bring to the table to help you with the blind spots, the things you're missing, right? And, and what's, what's the, the, the idea, the market knowledge, the, the opportunity? Yeah. Um, other questions? Yeah. Um, what advice do you have when networking? Like, um, do you have any tips like how to remember people in faces or like what kind of stuff helps you with networking? Yeah, I'd love to say I'm, I'm awesome at networking, right? Um, I think uh, there's certain people that are really, really into networking. They're people people. Um, I uh, am a little bit of a hybrid, introvert, extrovert. And so um, sometimes it's hard for me to reach out and to, to say hi to people. Um, but I think the, the key there for me is, is number one, opening my mouth. Right, just do it. Just, just say hi. It might be hard, but um, you know, get over that initial uh, fear and just just meet people. Um, the other thing I would tell you is that you never know when the deal, the next deal, is going to come along. You never know when an opportunity is going to going to how you're going to find the next opportunity. And so, to increase your odds, you need to talk to a lot of people. 
right? And people that you may not think you'd ever do business with, they may know somebody or introduce you to somebody you would do business with, right? Um, a little secret that I use is uh, I use my contacts in my phone, try to get their contact information, and I put down how I know them and where I found them and when we met, put some, some personal details there. And then I use LinkedIn to connect. So again, Tyler Whitaker on LinkedIn. Please go connect with me. I, I'd love to introduce you to people that could help you. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. So you were working with some different business partners when you started your business. How do you kind of keep things professional and stay friends? Because I know a lot of times when you partner with someone or a friend, or especially family, things can get pretty rocky. So what advice would you have on keeping things okay between partnerships? Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard, it is hard. Um, going into business with family is really difficult. I haven't done that. Um, but from, from uh, learning from other people's mistakes, you know, um, like I, I haven't done that yet. Um, the uh, the <laughs> couple things you need to do, though, is find people with high integrity. People who will do what they say they're going to do, right? People that share the same values as you. Um, when you're talking about developing a partnership, um, it's really important to know who those people are when they're stressed, when they're not stressed, when they're happy, when they're sad, right? Um, the more experience you can have with these people, the better off you, you will, uh, you'll have. Um, I, you know, founded some, a company with two extraordinary individuals, Keith, Keith Barr. I had worked with him in a previous company. He was, he was my, my boss. He was the, the, the CTO when I was a VP of engineering and we developed a, a fast friendship. And, and um, even though he's, uh, he's 20 years older than me, uh, we're great friends, uh, you know, work really well together. My other partner, Bob Argyle, equally wonderful man, a uh, lot of integrity, um, you know, fun guy to hang out with. And, and we, spent, we spent probably a year working on forming our business before we actually pulled the trigger. Right. The other thing I would tell you is that we got to put an operating agreement in place. So we understood how we would interact as partners and how the business would run. So it was you know, a legal document that, that kind of governed that. So that's, that's important. Um, you know, one, of the, one of the things that I th I've, I've uh, believe in and have heard done is that uh, when you uh, set up the ownership, you do that on a vesting schedule to ensure that your partners are there for four years maybe, where you're vesting 25% a year or, or you know, 148 the month as you go along. That way, if a partner decides, hey, this is not for me, and they exit, uh, then their ownership may be capped, right? Uh, it brings up a good point here is that um, wealth, in my mind, is driven by uh, two things. It's ideas. Brain power, you got to think. You got to think it through. Every every great business idea, every great um, wealth story starts with somebody sitting in a room thinking, "I wonder if I did this, right?" So so don't underestimate the the power of of, of generating that idea. Uh, the the second thing that I would tell you is um, that. Um, it, to, to have to have money is not to spend it, <laughs> right? You you gotta you gotta live within your means. You gotta be willing to to put forth the the effort. Uh, nothing is ever free, right? Um, there's a lot of get rich quick schemes out there. That sound really good. Um, the reality is is that every great entrepreneur is an overnight success only because people didn't see the ten years they spent building to that point. Right? So don't be afraid of the work. Don't be afraid to, to add the value and to create the value. So you know, there's, there's maybe two classes of people in, in, this, in this world, the people who, who take and people who give. You gotta be the one who's always giving and producing and creating. And you're gonna, you know, if you, if you decide to go the corporate route to get some experience, I think that's a great way to do that. Um, you build some skills so that you have the skills necessary to start a business. Um, but always be the one that's there a little bit later, there a little earlier, that's doing a little bit more than they've been asked, that's, that's trying to take on the projects their boss is responsible for to help that person. Always be willing to, to
to put a little more effort in than maybe the compensation you're getting. That's how, that's how you drive real value for yourself. And ultimately, that's the, the kind of uh, mentality you're going to have to have when you start a business is that, you know, uh, you're going to go from a, you know, eight, eight, a nine to five, eight hour a day job in the corporate world and you're going to start a business and immediately you're going to be thrust into a 12 to 16 hour a day job, <laughs> right? It never turns off, you know, uh, and... Uh, you know, as you as you get married, I've been really lucky to have a wonderful wife who's been a, a partner with me and is willing to sacrifice to be able to, to start these businesses and run these businesses. Um, but but that's a, a key a key factor as well. Other qu question? Uh, yeah, just you talked about being able to work from about anywhere in the world. Um, that's one of the things I'm wanting to be able to do as well. But going along with that, I've been able to spend a lot of time over the last few years. And it feels like I get pretty potentially work on my computer for years on end. How do you go about, you know, while you're in Australia or these other places, balancing time with your family or business and living your life, I guess? Or do you have any tips on calling your good to some extent? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to say I'm great at that. Um, Work-life balance is something I'm, I'm definitely striving for. Definitely in the last couple of years, I've been trying to spend more time as my, as my co-founders are exiting the business and I'm, I'm uh, in, still in the business and, and working and pushing. Um, that work-life balance is, is a hard thing, right? But you gotta be in tune with, with, with who you are and what's important to you, right? And sometimes, Sometimes you can, you can push and grind and, and work the 12 hour days, the, the all nighters. Um, yeah, my wife will attest to, to how many all nighters I've pulled you know, over, the, over the years. Sometimes that's what's required and sometimes that's what you do. Um, I've always tried to take time off to try to unplug. Uh, I, I'd say I'm not great at that, but I'm, I'm working on it. So yeah, definitely something to consider. Yeah. Yeah. First one is, uh, I wonder how many hours that you work in a day typically, I mean, toward your business. And yeah. uh, second, I just wonder uh, what type of culture is inside of your business and how did you establish that? Yeah, so my, my leadership style is to lead from the front, right? Um, I'm, I'm more willing, to, uh, it, if I'm going to ask somebody to do something, I'm w willing to do that too, right? And so, um, you know, uh, I... Uh, it's interesting. There's been times where I've worked, you know, 18 hour days. Yeah, I mean, full on just work hard, right? There's been times where um, I've been able to sit back and have the right people in place where I've been able to maybe cut that back to eight or nine hours, <laughs> you know? Um, right now I've got a really great team we've been building and hiring and taking, you know, I've been taking my hats off and giving them to, to other folks. And so it's, it's a little more reasonable now, but I can tell you as a business owner, um, it never shuts off, right? This morning, I'm, I'm looking at my phone. You know, I, on the vacation tracker, I, I took the day off, but I've been, I was looking at my phone, I've been scheduling some meetings. You just, you can't not do it sometimes, right? And it's, a, it's this flywheel effect, right? The faster I push the flywheel, the faster we go as a company, the faster I get to the next set of goals that I've set, the faster I get here, and it becomes a game. It really does. And, and I think from a work-life balance perspective, if you can make it a game, if you can have fun doing it, that's going to help with burnout, right? If it becomes drudgery, that's when you know you got to pull back a little bit and you got to spend some time, you know, self-care time, take some time off a little bit, regroup and, re and think about it. But um, that's, that's something I would tell you is, is don't be afraid of the hard work, but try to make sure you're having fun doing it because you're going to wake up you know, 35 years from now, and you're going to realize, wow, I spent a lot of time at work, and you know, hopefully, you didn't miss too many family activities. We've been really blessed. We've spent a lot of time at family activities. We've been able to carve that out. That's been important to us. Could we have gone faster had I not done that? Possibly, but I think I would have lost something, and so I, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend um, being so far to that extreme. So. We have time for one quick question and answer, and then we have a, a, a brief announcement from Ellie and Brent. Yeah, question. What are some of the traits that you notice in people that are successful in your field? 
So, so one of the things that I've noticed is uh, generosity, right? There's an abundance mentality there. They're always willing to give more and do more, right? Um, one of the things I strive to do is to offer. Not, I, not that people take me up on the offer. I, I mean, I've offered you guys, connect with me on LinkedIn. Please do connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to watch your success. I'd love to help you if I can, right? The, the vast majority of people may not, and that's, that's okay. But um, yeah, you know, they're driven. They know what they wanna do in life. And they have a plan. They put a system in place, set of goals, set of habits. Right, and they have a, an abundance mentality where they're they're willing to to help and and be generous. Thanks, guys. This has been great. Really appreciate your time. <laughs> <laughs>